Hello, my name is MJ, and I am a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement with the Institute. This includes volunteering for evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the virtual audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please email your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. And now, please join me in welcoming Director Dave Cotter, who will introduce our guest today. Well, greetings everyone from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and the Command and General Staff College. Uh, my name is Dave Cotter. I'm the Director of the Department of Military History here at the college. Uh, and, and I'm here to, to welcome you to the next installment in our, in our Dole uh, Institute Command and General Staff College collaboration, which is uh, the theme of which is the periphery of war. Uh, and this is the uh, eighth installment of, of this year's plan, uh, this year's program. And Dr. Randy Mullis will discuss Bleeding Kansas and the British Kafria uh, in the 1850s, both of which were peripheral operations uh, in the mid 19th century. Uh, Dr. Randy Mullis is a retired Air Force officer. Uh, he took his PhD uh, right there at, at University of Kansas uh, in 2002. Uh, he's a historian of great experience uh, and reputation. Uh, he's, he's taught at the University of Maryland. He's taught at the United States Air Force Academy's History Department. Uh, he is, in fact, uh, a veteran of 22 years of the Department of Military History uh, here at the Command and General Staff College, not including a three-year hiatus when he was the chair of the Department of Security Studies and Criminal Justice at Angelo State University in Texas. Uh, Dr. Mullis is particularly well suited to discuss the, not only the peripheral uh, operations, uh, it, it, which is attendant to our theme, of course, uh, but he is uh, the author of Peacekeeping on the Plains, Army Operations in Bleeding Kansas. And so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Randy Mullis. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, this presentation uh, looking at, uh, uh, to a certain degree, at Bleeding Kansas uh, and British uh, Kafraria, uh, which is in uh, present day South Africa. So it's my honor to be here with you and I just want to offer a quick thanks uh, to the audience, but also to the Dole Center for their support for this program and this opportunity to throw out some new ideas uh, and hopefully get some comments, perhaps some questions for you uh, on some of these ideas regarding colonialism uh, and wars of the periphery that I will offer to you uh, today. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. So what I wanna to do today uh, is focus on a couple of key questions that have interested me, not only in Bleeding Kansas, but also in colonial history writ large. I had the opportunity to go to South Africa in 2010. I uh, got to visit Johannesburg, uh, Pretoria, Cape Town, and it really developed an interest in me on the settlement uh, of that part of the world compared to the American West. So that's part of what I'll be talking about today, but I'll give you some specific questions I'm looking at. One of the big picture issues that I will address uh, deals with uh, this notion or concept of colonialism uh, or imperialism. Uh, I know we're all familiar with the term, uh, but there's been some interesting uh, uh, developments uh, within that field that I'll share with you today. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly for today's purposes, looking at the American and the British approach to settlement, not only in South Africa or British Kafraria in particular, uh, but also in Kansas uh, in the 1850s. Uh, and I'll try to weave in some of the military approaches as well, uh, because it's not necessarily at the forefront, but it's certainly on the sidelines as far as how that development occurred. And then lastly, and perhaps most productively for me, to get your comments, your thoughts and questions on these particular uh, issues. <clears throat> 
One thing I want you to keep in mind, though, as we begin this journey is uh, at the Staff College, like many military institutions, uh, we look at various forms of international relations. And one uh, that I'm going to emphasize right now is called realism. And for those of you familiar with the concept and, and to the father of realism, a guy named Thucydides, who wrote a great book called The Peloponnesian Wars, uh, this is kind of his one sentence summary of what international relations are all about that the strong do what they can, and sadly, the weak suffer what they must. So one thing I want you to think about as we walk through brilliant Kansas and South Africa, uh, is this as simple as it gets? Is this purely uh, power relationships uh, between uh, colonial powers, the US and Britain, uh, and indigenous populations, or is there more to it? Uh, the next question or next comment I want you to think about uh, deals with uh, a contemporary of the 1850s, uh, John Stuart Mill. And he made this quote, which I think is quite appropriate for today's uh, lecture discussion as well. And he states that despotism under certain circumstances is a legitimate mode of government dealing with quote unquote barbarians. So I don't think it's too far of a stretch for us to acknowledge that most settlers, which we'll focus on, uh, considered indigenous populations to be savages, barbarians, or something less than equal to what they were. But here's the catch. He said that you can use despotic measures uh, as long as they uh, contribute to a positive end state. In other words, kind of like Machiavelli, uh, the ends justify the means. So that's something uh, to think about, both Thucydides as well as John Stuart Mill, as we look at these 19th century uh, uh, periphery conflicts uh, and what prompts them, how they're conducted, and the big so what, uh, hopefully we'll get to at the end. So here are some of the questions that I am focusing on uh, today. Uh, one deals with this notion of, are there common approaches to colonization? Uh, is the US approach, quote unquote, exceptional? Uh, was there a distinct way of colonization from a Western perspective, which goes beyond just uh, the American uh, and the British, but to include the French, the German, the Portuguese, the Spanish. But we won't go down that road in today's uh, session. But here are the new things I want you to, uh, to ponder and, and see if they really uh, resonate with you uh, as, uh, as concepts that are useful. The first will be something called settler colonial, colonialism. Uh, this has been an issue or come up in the historical community in the last 10 to 15 years. Another one, although I won't emphasize it as much, is internal colonialism. Uh, it's been around at least since the 60s. I remember as an undergraduate at Auburn uh, reading this book by Michael Hector uh, that really intrigued me about how the British uh, learn how to be good uh, colonial masters or imperialists. And that's dealing with indigenous populations in the United Kingdom, the Scots, the Welch, uh, and uh, the Irish, of course. So we'll come back to that as we go along. Uh, the next question or uh, focus is going to be on these approaches, uh, uh, again, looking and comparing and contrasting uh, their differences and their similarities. And then lastly, what role did the British Army and the US Army play within these larger strategies? Okay, again, I mentioned earlier, they may not have been the main effort, but they're certainly contributing to activities, uh, to developments, uh, to settlements in Kansas, as well as South Africa. So that's our focus. Uh, so one of the big terms uh, of the three that I'm looking at today uh, is a comparison of American history with colonial history, with British history, between those two specific areas. And Howard Lamar is one of the big names in comparing, or, or using a comparative approach, looking at uh, North American and um, uh, African or European history. And it gives us this transatlantic focus uh, of what constitutes Western colonialism. But these are the key things I think to take away. If you're familiar with American history, and I have a feeling this audience is, you're probably familiar with Frederick Jackson Turner and his frontier thesis, which basically makes a strong argument that we Americans expand, but we do it differently than our British, French, and Spanish uh, 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 compatriots.
okay, that we are at heart uh, anti-imperialist. But when you look at definitions, when you look at processes and procedures, I think that's a little bit hard to carry looking back at history, particularly when I compare the two areas uh, today. So my argument is going to be that, yes, we're Americans, but no, we are not particularly exceptional when it comes to uh, justifying and conducting uh, colonial activities, whether it's continental U.S., uh, abroad, or certainly compared to what the British did on a global scale. So that's what I want to focus on today as far as comparative approach. But I also want to emphasize uh, uh, this notion of colonialism. And I'm going to offer just a very simple definition uh, for you to ponder as we go through today's uh, discussion. So in that definition, domination is one of the critical words. Uh, how you dominate uh, a state, a people, uh, or a territory certainly uh, is going to be uh, vary from country to country. Uh, but extending political and economic control fits within the larger concept of colonialism. So you see Cecil Rhodes on the left. Uh, you see Uncle Sam on the right, uh, stretching uh, from one continent to the other, or in Cecil Rhodes' case, from the Cairo to the Cape, uh, which indicates uh, that these areas have special interest to Great Britain and to the United States. So with that broad definition, uh, one thing I want you to think about as well, or I'm going to try to emphasize, are four common characteristics which I think connect American and British colonialism, this notion of domination. Now, is it benevolent domination? Uh, is it coercive? Uh, we can debate that all day, but it depends on what perspective you're looking at. Uh, the notion of dependency, that both in the British and American uh, traditions, that both will use strategies that render indigenous populations dependent on the British or American government or on local governments, uh, more specifically, uh, settler communities uh, as they expand. Now, there will be some differences with South Africa, and we'll get to those uh, toward the end of our discussion. Uh, exploitation. Uh, it's not just about people, uh, but resources, uh, the land, uh, the environment are certainly part of this exploitive aspect of colonialism to enhance, to enrich uh, the colonizer. And lastly, uh, and I don't, I don't think this is particularly controversial, but the notion of inequality, particularly uh, from a racial or social perspective. Uh, that racism, uh, ethnocentrism has been around for some time. Uh, we certainly have addressed those issues uh, head on, and we are still addressing them. And uh, just before I forget, uh, it was nice of Pope Francis to make a quick visit to Canada uh, to uh, offer an apology to the First Nations or the indigenous peoples of Canada uh, for the Catholic Church's uh, contribution uh, to um, exploitation and um, uh, oppression of these native peoples uh, when it came to education and culture uh, and those sorts of things. So uh, we may get back to that a little bit later, but it was just uh, uh, convenient uh, given the time frame to throw that out and make a connection there as well. So that being said, what the heck is settler uh, colonialism? So I offer or offer you these characteristics of what settler colonialism is, and it focuses uh, on white settlement. So it's limited to Europeans for the most part. Uh, it does focus beyond just uh, occupation of territory, although that's critical, but also exploitation of labor. And it doesn't have to be indigenous folks. Uh, this is where institutions such as slavery of Africans, not only in North America, but you have the same phenomenon in South Africa. Uh, the Boers, who we'll mention later, uh, will import slaves from East Africa, from Madagascar, uh, as far as ways Indonesia and India. OK, so slavery is not unique to the American experience, but it's part of this a settler tradition to a certain degree. But the three key terms here are dispossession in particular, uh, dispossessing the original inhabitants, the indigenous peoples of their land and ultimately, uh, in many cases, of their lives, which, of course, hints at genocide. Uh, and if genocide doesn't occur, occur, then we get into what uh, I often refer to as ethnocide. Uh, you transform, uh, you uh, compel uh, the indigenous population to adapt to the dominant culture uh, as well. So that's another technique that we'll get into. Exploitation and then lastly, violence that sanctioned violence. Uh, so to speak, the U.S. Army or the British Army uh, were not necessarily the primary tools of settler colonialism. Uh, they are there, and we'll talk about that briefly toward the end. So ultimately, the purpose of settler co colonialism, uh, as um, 
um, uh, Patrick Wolf, who really was the, kind of the father of pushing this concept forward, argued, uh, was to replace uh, local, original, indigenous populations with an invasive settler society. That once settlers show up, their raison d'etre is to exist and to stay and to expand. So whether you agree or not, uh, we'll see what you think once we get to the end of today's talk. But normally involves large-scale immigration. I'm not sure how that's defined exactly, but it could be uh, motivated by religious uh, or political or other forces. And certainly religion uh, plays a large part of settler colonialism, not only in North America, but also in South Africa uh, as well. So I, I, I've got this graphic of uh, the globe as it exists today. And basically the point here is to show that North America, particularly the United States uh, and Southern Africa, uh, still have uh, uh, respectable uh, numbers of ethnic Europeans. Certainly uh, North America, Canada, the U.S. Uh, is largely uh, uh, traced back to its European origins. South Africa is much less, but when compared to the rest of Africa, I think it makes for an interesting comparison uh, of why South Africa and, uh, and the rest of the story hopefully will come forth as we move on. So I won't emphasize this as much as settler colonialism, but I think internal colonialism makes for an interesting uh, notion of explaining uh, how uh, powers such as the United States and Great Britain uh, in integrated populations near their borders. In other words, you don't have to set sail to a different continent to be a colonizer. Uh, both in South Africa, once the initial colonies are established by the Dutch and then later by the British, uh, there's a constant movement to the east, just as there would be in the United States uh, after Plymouth, after Jamestown, uh, a constant push toward the west. Now, there's south and north, of course, uh, but it's largely an east-west uh, phenomenon. But the key point here is uh, I think Americans uh, in the British tradition learn how to be good uh, uh, colonizers based on this experience uh, that the British had, or the English more specifically, uh, with the Irish, with the Scots, and with the Welsh. Okay, so more on that perhaps a little bit later. So that being said, uh, these are the common denominators I took away between colonialism, settler colonialism, and internal colonialism. Notice they're very similar, and I think they all uh, reinforce each other regardless of which model or which definition you want to follow. Another point about colonization, though, is more often than not, one of the motivating features, one of the pervasive features is to extend your culture, your way of life, your beliefs, your political system beyond your national borders. And I think we see this both in British Kafraria as well as uh, the turmoil that evolved around bleeding Kansas. So this graphic uh, is basically just to give a, a depiction of not from the indigenous perspective, but how did the British and Americans see themselves uh, in the great A's age of imperialism or of colonization. And if you look at the image on the left, uh, where it refers to uh, civilization, of humanity, of freedom, that the ultimate goal of this union of not just the British and Americans, but for our purposes, uh, that's what I'm emphasizing, to bring these wonderful things uh, to the rest of the world. And if you're familiar with the, the white man's burden, I mean, this these images are part of that era as well. And also on the right, because this is very specific to uh, South Africa, uh, because it still has the theme of white uh, mission of white civilization, European civilization. But notice uh, that the Transvaalite, uh, who is a Boer, uh, is paying homage to uh, Britannia, Britannia here. Uh, and notice the, the focus is all one. Uh, and it implies a unity of not only uh, uh, Europeans, but Europeans that have settled in other places such as South Africa, and that our mission is one in the same. Okay, and you can read more into that as you see uh, fit, uh, but just something to share with you from a contemporary uh, perspective of the U.S. and Great Britain. So when we look now into a macro view of 19th century uh, perspectives, what we see is this emphasis on civilization, uh, but it's from a, a very Western perspective. And in many ways, Christianity and education are combined both. 
uh, as mentioned with the Pope's uh, apology uh, for 500 years of um, uh, the, the Catholic uh, Church basically uh, uh, de-Indianizing uh, First Nations in Canada, uh, this is still with us today. So it's not a historical event. It is a contemporary issue uh, and perhaps is part of our larger structure. But racism and ethnocentrism are certainly part of this larger uh, uh, development. But again, dependency. Uh, whether it was intentional or unintentional, uh, British and American systems uh, generally uh, uh, targeted the leadership of indigenous populations to make them dependent uh, either through monetary reward, annuities, uh, land, um, uh, gifts, you name it. Uh, and that way they kind of cut their authority with their own peoples. And we see this both in uh, South Africa as well as uh, uh, the Plains, which we'll, we'll get to later. But land, labor, and violence are other characteristics that we see, uh, that violence is a means to a justifiable end, back to John Stuart Mill, uh, that despotic activities are sometimes necessary if they lead to a greater good. But did we or will we ever get to that level? Uh, reserve systems, reservations, as we call them now in the United States, uh, the, uh, the colonial uh, government, the Cape Colony government will create buffer zones, uh, zones exclusive for the COSA, which will be the primary uh, nation that we'll talk about uh, when we get to South Africa, and can justify this movement either east or west uh, to maintain national security. So, uh, without belaboring this too much, in the U.S., we're more familiar with this, I think, uh, the, the great movement from the east to the West, that it was our manifest destiny to spread the blessings of American civilization and justice and truth in the American way. Uh, but we did it a little bit differently than what we see in South Africa. Uh, there is a, uh, a big difference, as you see with uh, the treaty method, that the U.S. government uh, from the get-go uh, usually generally used session treaties or removal treaties uh, as a process to force Native Americans, uh, the indigenous population, to move from one area to another, okay, which was part of our larger separation strategy. Uh, the Sioux Wars, for example, which I start from 1854, are a manifestation of the treaty system that didn't quite work out so well. Uh, you also have, uh, uh, kind of from a grand strategy perspective, and this is from uh, one of my former instructors at KU, uh, Don Fixico, who basically said from a Native American perspective, uh, the westward expansion didn't look manifest at all, but it looked like an invasion, first going through the central plains, second going to the northern plains, and lastly, uh, toward the end of the Native American or American Indian Wars, uh, going into the southwest. So chronologically, that is more or less what happens. Whether it was conscious or not, that's certainly debatable. But initially, we do uh, go from the east coast to the west coast, from the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, and the United States becomes, uh, uh, at least territorially, what it is today. The South African experience is similar, but slightly different. Uh, there are going to be at least nine frontier wars over a hundred year period between the British uh, and uh, uh, the British Army uh, and other uh, military units uh, from the Cape, uh, engaging uh, largely with the Kosa, with the Zulu, uh, and other uh, indigenous populations in South Africa. Uh, the one other difference that I'll highlight is the British are also uh, fixated on controlling the ports of South Africa that border the Indian Ocean. Cape Town, which is where the Boers, the Dutch, original Dutch settlers, uh, well, they weren't settlers then, they were traders, will establish uh, is a, in lovely Cape Town, South Africa, which has some very strategic characteristics to it, which I'll get to here uh, shortly. But eventually the Boers, uh, once the British take control of uh, the colony, uh, will be displeased with British governance and they will exodus, they will conduct the great trek from the coast into the interior of modern day South Africa. And just like the United States or other indigenous peoples in South Africa, uh, the Nthingo, who I'll mention specifically right now, uh, basically will accommodate with the European settlers, with the European colonizers, whether they're Boers or British, uh, they basically will try to assimilate, which is another uh, strategic approach here, with the uh, colonial population uh, to a certain degree of success. But that depends on how you interpret success, of course, from a British or an indigenous uh, perspective. So here's an image of the early uh, settlement of Cape Town. Uh, if you've had the opportunity to go there, uh, you probably were impressed with Table Mountain in the background. 
Uh, Table Bay is a great port facility. The location is ideal. It's the uh, transition basically from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean. So the British, uh, which acquired the colony in 1806, uh, it comes to them as a result of the Napoleonic conflicts. Okay, a much longer story. Mark Gerges loves Napoleon conflict, and I'm sure he could better address this than I can. But the bottom line is the British come in and the Boers are eventually going to try to move out uh, from uh, that uh, area of South Africa. This image, uh, which I just put up here, uh, it probably resonates with the audience in the sense that uh, it uh, 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 looks a lot like the American West. You've got the wagons, you've got the settlers, uh, you've got the oxen, and they're making their way uh, into um, uh, the uh, Great Plains, for lack of a better term, it's actually the Vibhadrashan of Central South Africa, which uh, ironically, uh, in some ways, looks a lot like the American West, so uh, just for what it's worth. But just like in the American scenario, you will see uh, our, our, uh, there were Native American or our indigenous population uh, resistance to uh, these settler movements. And uh, this image, for example, comes from 1838. Instead of uh, the Lakota, which we'll talk about later, you'll see uh, Zulu warriors here engaging uh, boars on the boar trek or the great trek from the east, uh, or rather from the west uh, to the east. So some interesting parallels just, just want to highlight as far as the two areas are concerned. So here are the main points, I think, about British Caffraria, which is one of the many uh, colonies that the British created uh, in um, uh, their tenure there as colonial masters up, up until the Republic of South Africa uh, is formed uh, in um, 1910. So eastward expansion, as I mentioned, is one of the uh, key issues. Instead of west to east, or east to west rather, they are going uh, east to west. Again, very similar to the notion of manifest destiny in the U.S. Um, they will encounter um, uh, the indigenous peoples and they will use violence. They will use the regular British army to engage with Zulu, to engage uh, with uh, the Kosa, uh, but they will also use uh, uh, locals as militia, uh, such as the Nthingo, the Fingos, as I mentioned, as part of the um, uh, frontier arm mounted police, uh, or uh, uh, even more so with the Cape Mounted Rifles. So uh, it's a mix of military forces or a hybrid uh, that help facilitate the movement uh, from east to west. Now, the other interesting thing to me is the British will also recruit uh, specific ethnic groups to settle in South Africa. Uh, South Africa to this day has a much lower uh, white or European population, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but in the aftermath of the Crimean War, uh, there were Germans uh, who participated in that conflict uh, that were looking for opportunity. The British said, hey, these guys uh, know how to shoot, they're disciplined, uh, they're farmers in their normal life, let's incentivize them uh, to make the trek, to make the journey to South Africa. And what you see in the image is a monument uh, to those Germans that made their way into South Africa. And to this day, there are uh, towns with German names like Berlin uh, and some other uh, German-esque uh, communities. But ultimately, uh, with the German Legion, with uh, other settlers from Ireland, from Scotland uh, and, and Wales, uh, which, by the way, are still segregated <laughs> from English settlements, um, uh, they will continue to move from east to west. But part of the larger strategy is to remove those coastal populations. And again, as I mentioned earlier, into reserves, uh, into smaller areas, normally less fertile land. Uh, but for the most part, the coastas are uh, largely uh, uh, agrarian uh, 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 cattle farmers. Okay. Uh, they, they, that's part of their economy, but that's also part of their culture as well, uh, which I'll mention briefly uh, in, in a moment. Uh, but the one big difference here that I wanted to emphasize is unlike the American experience, for the most part, Lord Grey and the colonial government wanted to integrate the coastal population or what's referred to here as excess population into the economic system. That because of the demographic imbalance, the lack of European workers, uh, Gray was adamant saying, hey, uh, one way to get workers for our, uh, our, our towns, uh, for our farms, uh, is to encourage the indigenous peoples uh, to join this. So you see this transformation uh, similar to what the U.S. will do a little bit later on with assimilation or the Dawes Act, uh, but to convert 
uh, kosher warriors into farmers, uh, or at least to farm workers, at least in South Africa. Uh, the cattle killing incident, which I'll talk about, uh, as I mentioned earlier briefly, uh, is an opportunity for the British, for the Cape Colony, to exploit uh, massive losses, massive uh, dislocation of the COSA uh, to achieve territory, but also to produce laborers that they so uh, uh, desire. And it also creates, though, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with uh, colonialism in general, but settler colonialism, uh, the need uh, or the strategy to weaken uh, colonial chiefs. Uh, to um, take uh, their power or their authority from them uh, by inserting uh, Western justice systems, inserting uh, uh, Indian agents, or in the South African case, uh, magistrates uh, that enforce British law within COSA populations. So that technique doesn't work overnight, but it does limit the power of the chiefs as they used to be, both in the Lakota and in the COSA uh, scenario. Uh, they limit uh, some of the practices, some of the cultural routines that deprive chiefs such as uh, uh, Sandile, as you see here uh, in the image. Uh, and lastly, uh, you see this emphasis again on segregation, on assimilation, amalgamation in some cases, uh, and even genocide. Uh, if not genocide, then ethnocide, and we'll uh, detail those long as we go along. But uh, just for grins, uh, many of you are familiar with Nelson Mandela, uh, who uh, is uh, uh, you know the recent leader of South Africa. Uh, you are familiar with apartheid, uh, but he is of COSA lineage and, uh, again, a very different scenario in South Africa in the long term than what we see here in the United States. So writ large, uh, I've covered these, so I'm not going to uh, uh, reemphasize them to any great degree, but separation, uh, forcibly or ideally keeping uh, tribes separate from uh, white settlers, white pioneers, however you want to characterize the movement from east to west or west to east. And both nations pursued that policy, but Gray, when he shows up in 1854, uh, is going to begin to change that orientation and emphasize assimilation, uh, largely because of his perceived need that, yes, um, you know, it, it helps security to keep the two peoples apart from each other, but it doesn't help the colonial economy, uh, that economic imperatives are driving this process of assimilation. Now, that not to imply uh, that COSA, COSA workers on a farm or in Cape Town are socially equal uh, to Anglos or to Europeans, uh, but it does imply a, a different approach uh, to a large degree. Um, and, and that basically sums that up. Uh, and one of the techniques uh, that you see um, uh, is, uh, you know, back to the Pope again and why he's in Canada, is using religious schools. Uh, uh, the Anglicans uh, had a, a large setup, the Presbyterians, Methodists uh, in South Africa, very similar to what you see in Kansas with the Osage Mission or the Potawatomi Mission that many of you are probably familiar with. And very quickly, uh, this uh, will, um, uh, will, you know, ideally would be an entire presentation of its own, but looking from uh, the COSA perspective, the Native American perspective, and the images you see in front of you, uh, the upper image is Keokuk, uh, who is a, a Sauk and Fox chief, just like his more famous uh, colleague, uh, Black Hawk, that you see at the bottom. And they too had strategies, they being indigenous populations. And this is much simplified, uh, and it's more nuanced than what I'm presenting, but essentially uh, resistance or accommodation as these white powers, these white colonizers, colonizers rather, went from east to west or west to east. So I use Kia Cook and Black Hawk because Kia Cook uh, is uh, essentially a, a, an accommodator. Uh, he believed that to keep the Sock and Fox alive, to keep them viable, he had to work out an agreement with uh, uh, the government and would often remove the, the tribe further west. Black Hawk uh, is most noted for being a resistor. Uh, that enough is enough. Uh, how can we trust the U.S. government? How can we trust the treaty process? And would physically resist the U.S. government uh, and settler populations that were moving into Illinois along the Rock um, uh, Island and uh, uh, the river there. Uh, and is probably more famous because he did resist. Uh, for you Chicago Blackhawk fans, uh, there's a correlation with that. Uh, there is no team named after Kiyoko. Not that that means anything, uh, but it's an interesting uh, reflection on how we perceive Native American leaders and their choices uh, uh, years after the fact. 
and Macoma uh, fills that same role uh, as Keokuk and um, uh, Blackhawk did. Uh, he's the supreme, I don't say he's the supreme leader, but he's the chief, chief for lack of better terms, uh, but often found himself using accommodation and resistance to try to keep the Kosha nation, the Kosha people, uh, collectively together as one, because disunity uh, was a weapon that colonizers could use against both indigenous, indigenous peoples. Which gets back now to Thucydides, uh, the strong do what they want, the weak endure what they, mu what they must. And if you've ever read the Malian dialogue, you know it's about the Malian's reaction to the Greeks saying, hey, you're supposed to be bringing democracy. Uh, we're not seeing any justice from this process. Uh, and I think from an indigenous perspective, you could make that same uh, argument. So very briefly, uh, I just want to walk through some newspaper um, characterizations of how uh, the colonial government under Gray is uh, proceeding in South Africa. One choice was maybe we should use the Boers uh, as a buffer between us and the Kosa or the Zulu or whoever uh, we want to do. But the Dutch, or not the Dutch, but the Boers, uh, were not uh, uh, compliant supporters of that policy and kept moving away uh, anyway. So that was not a particularly good option for the Cal uh, Cape government. The German Legion that I talked about earlier um, had high hopes for this, but in reality, uh, just to give you the rest of the story, uh, uh, many of the German soldiers that migrated to South Africa uh, were not very good farmers. Uh, they were more intrigued by adventure and actually would join the British army uh, uh, because there was a revolt in India, the, the Sepoy uh, rebellion that some of you may be familiar with. So they would actually uh, leave South Africa to go with the British army to support that uh, initiative. Uh, but conceptually, uh, again, it's part of the larger strategy to bring more Europeans into uh, South Africa. Uh, local populations, uh, I mentioned the Fingo earlier, uh, but the challenge of accommodation here, uh, and I think from other coasts of people, they might refer, refer to the Fingos as basically collaborators because uh, they worked with uh, their colonizers, they worked with the British, uh, are they denying their own culture and their own heritage, but they were yet held hostage because as, this, as these quotes point out, if they didn't behave, the British government would simply take away their land, their houses, uh, and their means of existence. So is that really equality? Obviously not, uh, but it was an option that certainly the Infingo choice chose during that time. And again, when you put it in a Native American perspective, uh, the Trail of Tears uh, with the Cherokee after the Removal Act had to make choices. Do we resist? Do we accommodate? And John Ross and various other Cherokee leaders, for the most part, opted to relocate in the hopes of saving the Cherokee Nation for all uh, times. And of course, the Cherokee Nation still exists, uh, but uh, not perhaps in the way that uh, John Ross originally uh, envisioned. And this uh, gets us to now to the cattle killing that I was referencing earlier. Again, this could take a good 20 or 30 minutes to explain the, the nuances of this. But the bottom line is uh, the Kosa, at least certain elements of the Kosa people, were very disillusioned. There was drought. Uh, their cattle were suffering from a disease, believe it or not, brought in from Europe. Uh, an epizootic occurred, uh, basically destroying tens of thousands of coaster cattle. And cattle not only have uh, nutritional value, uh, they also have political and spiritual value in the Kosa cultural traditions. And essentially, a prophetess came along, uh, Nankawasa, basically saying, hey, if we kill our cattle, if we destroy our crops, uh, our ancestors will be pleased and they will rise up from the earth uh, and they will help us push the white invaders back to the sea which is uh, not exactly, but very similar to uh, a Paiute named Wovoka's vision uh, later on that eventually led to Wounded Knee in South Dakota, where the ghost dance uh, basically becomes a spiritual promise of rejuvenation and revitalization. Uh, the uh, Nankawasa's prophecies did the same thing for the Kosa. Of course, ultimately, uh, all that resulted were a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of dead Kosa, a lot of dead cattle, an opportunity for George Gray to see an opportunity to seize more Kosa land and to encourage Kosa warriors, Kosa males and females now to become farm laborers and to be relocate 
to Cape Colony to be wage earners. It also encouraged Gray to transport, which was the term they used at the time, coastal leaders from coastal land, or British Caffraria in this case, uh, to Robben Island. So if you know anything about uh, South African history, Robben Island was the location where dissidents, guerrillas, insurgents, uh, Nelson Mandela himself were sent uh, to keep them out of uh, the mainstream uh, population. And lastly, uh, the military aspect. Uh, militaries to maintain in colonial areas was very expensive. Uh, Parliament wanted the governor, George Gray, to reduce costs and to use local forces as much as possible. Uh, he did his best, but you see this comment here that every time we reduce the regular army presence, uh, the Kaffirs or the Kosa, to be more specific, because Kaffir has a, a very pejorative connotation to it, uh, would seem to rise up and revolt. And again, you have nine wars in a hundred year period, and there are uprisings in between that. So there's this constant tension between the government, between the settlers, and between the indigenous populations of how do we pull this off. So what I want to focus on now for the la as we uh, get on the home stretch here uh, is basically um, uh, what, how does the American experience uh, look similar or different from what we just saw in South Africa? Well, to start with, you look at settlers, uh, uh, the pilgrims, the Puritans uh, going to New England. Uh, they're motivated by religious purposes, but they're also uh, motivated for other reasons. Again, a new world, a new land, not only to spread the blessings of Christianity, uh, but to make a new life for ourselves. So that concept will carry over, as we all know, not only from New England, uh, but uh, through the West, through Manifest Destiny, uh, and into other um, uh, expansion rhetoric uh, as well. Uh, this was the image I alluded to earlier uh, that probably best captures Manifest Destiny. Now, this is called American Progress from 1872, uh, but it really captures, and I use this in class quite frequently to ask my students to, you know, we're not going to do this today, obviously, but to analyze this image. What does it say about the American perspective of westward expansion of Manifest Destiny? And you see Native Americans, you see Buffalo uh, kind of fading off to the left into the west uh, as the wagons, very similar to the war trekkers, uh, uh, technology, uh, telegraph, railroads, uh, farming, mining, all these manifestations of the civilization uh, coming to uh, maybe not help Native Americans, but at least fulfilling our destiny. Uh, and, and does that make Americans exceptional? Did we really do anything differently than what the British did in South Africa? Something to ponder, uh, and I look forward to your comments on that uh, as opposed. So uh, on the home stretch here, as we look at Kansas specifically, uh, the good news is with the audience I anticipate today, uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Kansas, of course, is right in the middle. Uh, it's part of the Louisiana Purchase and certainly is part of the larger manifest destiny. Uh, what I'm displaying here basically are those strategic approaches from a Native American perspective of how the U.S. government, how settlers moved from east to west, first through the central, then through the northern, and lastly through uh, the southern plains. And that basically captures uh, what happened. Uh, the whys, of course, are debatable. Uh, here you see an image of Fort Laramie, which was located on the Oregon Trail, uh, which was a crossroads of trade between Native Americans and uh, uh, traders, uh, but also uh, was part of the security function of the U.S. Army to protect settlers going, again, uh, from Westport, uh, from St. Joseph, uh, and other locations along the Missouri River uh, to Utah, to California, uh, to Oregon. Very similar sorts of scenes in South Africa. This is uh, Fort Beaufort, uh, just outside of uh, British Caffraria. Uh, looks a little bit different, but it served uh, pretty much the same purpose. And of course, uh, the British Army, as did the American Army, uh, would deploy necessarily to subdue any sort of native or indigenous uprisings that occurred in both places. But these are the two main decision makers uh, looking uh, now specifically at Kansas and at Caffraria, uh, President Pierce uh, and uh, Governor Gray. Pierce uh, really focused on separation as the primary policy of the U.S. government. And as I alluded to earlier, Gray believes assimilation is going to be the best policy for uh, the future. The big difference is how each viewed indigenous labor. 
Gray uh, thought uh, uh, the COSA in particular would make good uh, um, um, uh, uh, workers, uh, wage earners. Uh, but as Howard Lamar uh, uh, characterized with uh, the larger perspective of Native Americans in the U.S., that essentially they had no economic function in the white world. Ergo, removal, separation, reservation seemed to be the best strategy uh, to manage Native Americans in the U.S. Uh, context. But let's focus now briefly on the Lakota, one of the larger um, uh, uh, aspects or parts of the larger Sioux Nation, along with the Dakota and the Nakota. Uh, but within the Lakota, of course, there are at least 10 bands uh, that go with that. So my key point here is eventually as U.S. expansion settlement went westward, uh, there was a trigger point uh, along the Oregon Trail particularly uh, a, a Latter-day Saint or Mormon immigrant train was getting close to Fort Laramie when one of the cows, a, a sick and lame cow, was actually uh, uh, killed by a hungry Minneconju. The owner of the, well, it wasn't a Mormon cow, but the Mormon-owned cow, uh, basically went to the fort, said, hey, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this Native American killed my cow, I want compensation. Usually the Indian agent uh, took care of those matters. Well, there was no Indian agent available at the time. So the lieutenant, the, the post commander at Laramie said, hey, what should we do? Uh, he, uh, in a discussion with a brevet lieutenant, John Grattan, uh, basically said, well, uh, we should be able to take care of this. They put an expedition together, make a long story short, they went to uh, Chief Bear's uh, camp. Uh, the Native Americans were there for their annuity payments and said, hey, turn over the perpetrator. He said, I don't know who it is. Shots were fired and Ultimately, all 30 of the expedition were killed by the uh, Minikanju, the Brule, and other uh, Lakota. Uh, basically, from the U.S. perspective, this was not, not seen as a U.S. responsibility, but uh, a massacre of U.S. soldiers that necessitated a government response, which led to uh, an expedition uh, that uh, General William Harney will lead, not in 1854 when this occurs, but in 1855. So at this point, uh, the Secretary of War, a guy named Jefferson Davis, uh, charters uh, Harney to put together uh, an expedition of about 11, 1,200 soldiers to punish the guilty Sioux, a process that Gray would also use uh, uh, for enforcing law or uh, agreements between uh, the COSA. Uh, to target Little Thunder's Brulee Band in particular, but ultimately, uh, once again, to degrade the chief's power and authority uh, when the uh, Brulee are actually engaged and defeated, uh, which means, you know, uh, I forget how many uh, warriors were actually killed, uh, but Harney also captures uh, about 80, 85 women and children to hold as hostages, which was another technique that the government would use to compel the indigenous populations uh, to behave or to comply with our wishes. But the long story short is in the aftermath of uh, Ash Hollow or Blue Water, uh, there was a peace treaty at Fort Pierre, and the Pierre Treaty basically dictated that each band of Lakota would have to identify a chief negotiator, a chief leader. In other words, one supreme leader, much like the U.S. system of having a president or a governor or a mayor or something that is sense, essentially holding them accountable for any misdoings by the tribe. And again, this was very similar to what Gray did with his magistrates in uh, South Africa, in Kosaland, in British Caffaria, uh, and it was a means to a larger end of uh, this goal of uh, degrading and co-opting uh, the power of the chiefs to ultimately either take land or compel these indigenous peoples to uh, comply with Western or American or British demands. So similar to, but not exactly the, as, as uh, grave as the consequences of the uh, cattle killing uh, in 1856 that I mentioned earlier, uh, but essentially uh, Native American choices uh, were, were limited accommodate or continue to resist. Now, the Sioux Wars uh, will continue, uh, but there's a, 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 a period of inactivity because of the American Civil War. I shouldn't say inactivity, but less activity. Uh, and after 1865, you'll see a renewed uh, uh, engagement between U.S. Army uh, settlers and uh, various indigenous peoples uh, to include the Cheyenne, uh, the Arapaho, uh, Osage, you name it, uh, from north to south. So essentially, uh, the other consequences that we see here, uh, uh, not only of war, of uh, regular violence between the two uh, uh, peoples, uh, but it leads to new strategies by the U.S. Uh, 
it's considered an assimilation strategy, but essentially it is uh, similar to you know, using Indian schools. Uh, you've heard the phrase, kill the Indian to save the man. Uh, and essentially that's what this was going to try to do. We're going to do away with reservations, give each Native American individual a, a plot of land. We will train them to be farmers. They will adopt to our lifestyle. They will attend our schools. Uh, they will adopt our political systems. And if they don't assimilate, uh, they will ultimately disappear anyway. So it's it's kind of a, a change uh, to a certain degree in grand strategy. But ultimately, just like the cattle killing uh, with Nankawasa's proph uh, prophecies, uh, Wavoka, as I mentioned earlier, uh, will uh, create this thing called the ghost dance, uh, which basically uh, is kind of an indicator of uh, you know, last ditch efforts to try to regain our former status or former concepts of who we are as Native Americans with a spiritual response. And it, if you're familiar with Wounded Knee or Dee Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, uh, you know uh, through a lot of unfortunate events uh, that results in the death of multiple uh, uh, Native Americans in the um, uh, uh, South Dakota uh, um, uh, area uh, near uh, present-day Wounded Knee. So uh, again, unfortunate results in both British Calf area and uh, along um, um, uh, South Dakota. So the last thing I want to point out, and, and just to get your thoughts on this, uh, that I alluded to earlier is in Bleeding Kansas, it's a little bit different than what we see in British Cafraria or along the Oregon Trail or other parts of the Santa Fe Trail. This is where white settlers now are going to compete with each other uh, on either currently or previously owned Native American lands. If you're familiar with uh, the session treaties that take place that uh, the Delaware, the Shawnee, uh, uh, the Potawatomi, uh, the New York, and there's a whole list of Native Americans that are asked one more time to relocate from Kansas into permanent Indian tori territory down in what now is Oklahoma. Well, you know the rest of the story with that, but I want to emphasize here, if you look at the seal of the territory of Kansas, uh, it kind of sends the same message that American progress did. Uh, you've got um, you know, an armed um, uh, pioneer here uh, with corn and wheat, uh, his lovely bride. Uh, and again, it manifests that image that we saw with Gast uh, uh, picture uh, related earlier. You do see Native Americans in Buffalo, but they're kind of minimized. Uh, I think given the implication that this is just temporary uh, until we fulfill our mission of, of civilizing, quote unquote, uh, this dangerous uh, territory of Kansas. But even the great seal of the great state of Kansas, and I love the motto at Aspera per Aspera, but notice the image. And uh, if, when you watch the video of the Dole Center, it's also up there that this is almost, uh, uh, you could take this right out of that American progress image that I discussed earlier, that this notion of American exceptionalism, American progress, American civilization still resonates with us today. Uh, but what's the rest of the story? And what does this mean from an indigenous or Native American or first people perspective? So the settlers that come into conflict with each other, this is you know white settlers on white settlers fighting over largely white issues, although the primary one is slavery or the expansion of slavery. Uh, many of you are gonna be familiar with the New England Immigrant Aid Company, whose charter uh, uh, specifically is to pr provide funds, provide transportation for New Englanders to go to move to Kansas not only to establish farmsteads, but also uh, to support uh, the free slave or free state movement uh, or the abolition movement in some cases. OK, so it's an interesting twist, I think, to settler colonialism, because not only are they procuring or moving to lands that uh, either were or were currently uh, supposed to be part of, for example, the Delaware Nation, uh, but that didn't stop them from uh, striking up homesteads and that sort of stuff as well. But even from the Southern perspective, uh, you have Jefferson Buford here, who you may not be as familiar with, but even in the South, there are expeditions that are funded uh, that are designed specifically to encourage slave owners to relocate from places like Alabama or Mississippi. Uh, and they actually relocated a couple of hundred of folks to Kansas uh, in late 1855, just in time uh, to participate in the Wakarusa War. 
Okay, so not only do these sellers want to control the political future of Kansas, they also engage in violence, and they also either intentionally or unintentionally engage in the dispossession of Native Americans as they do this. So perhaps some familiar faces here. Um, you've got Wilson Shannon, a territorial governor. You've got President Pierce, Sam Jones, the sheriff of Douglas County, and uh, uh, to the far right is Colonel um, uh, Edwin Bo Sumner, who's head of the 1st Cavalry. So back to the settler colonial question, you have all these settlers coming in and they're starting to kill each other. Who's responsible for monitoring, for controlling the violence, for enforcing even U.S. or territorial law, let alone the treaties with Native Americans that we mentioned earlier. So it's a very, very complex issue, particularly when you look at Kansas as a manifestation of colonialism or even settler colonialism in the larger view. So on the left, I have uh, just a quick image of the prelude to the Wakarusa War, uh, the first sacking of Lawrence in May of 1856. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the dispersal of the Topeka legislature, which was the free state attempt to establish its own government. Uh, and the U.S. Army uh, uh, compels them to disperse. Uh, there's more to the story than that. But these images of what role does a military play uh, when settlers begin to fight each other uh, is indicative of the challenges that Bleeding Kansas brought beyond, uh, but also related to uh, the slave, uh, uh, prop would Kansas be slave or would Kansas be free in the larger uh, political sense? So it's a very complicated, but I think engaging and uh, certainly uh, uh, interests me in Kansas history uh, from a slightly different perspective. So not to forget that settlers are fighting each other, but the U.S. Army is still compelled to go out and engage with, in this case, the Cheyenne in western Kansas, the Solomon River campaign, in 1857, which was the last thing that Jefferson Davis, the Secretary of War, uh, basically sent down uh, under his uh, tenure in that position. So these engagements uh, with military, uh, both in Kansas, both in British Calf area, they're not, all, not always the main effort. They're certainly on the periphery. Uh, but I want to leave you with today uh, are these conclusions. You know, from what you've heard or what you know, uh, were there common strategic approaches? Uh, is there any significant difference between what the Americans did uh, in the West compared to what uh, the British did in the South African East? Uh, I, I'm contending that they both had common ends, uh, but they may have varied their ways and their means, uh, but ultimately it's a clash between Western and tribal societies. OK, uh, and that's another presentation in of itself, uh, but uh, human agency uh, that the, the thought patterns of a George Gray, uh, a um, Franklin Pierce, a Wilson Shannon, um, you know, you, all the characters that involved in the American and South African scenario certainly impacted what they did and why they did it. Uh, but time and space certainly have changed our perspective. Uh, going back to the, uh, Pope Francis again, uh, this would have been an unheard of. You know, perhaps 10, even 20 years ago, certainly not 500 years ago, uh, when um, you know, these sorts of uh, uh, strategies of uh, Indian schools uh, to de-Indianize uh, young children to make them prospective citizens of their host nations. Ironically for the U.S., even when uh, uh, citizenship uh, was not uh, part of their, their birthright, uh, which doesn't occur until 1924. But lastly, uh, Thucydides and John Stuart Mill. Uh, you know, all this uh, discussion about colonialism, internal and settler and, and uh, uh, franchise colonialism, there's all sorts of things we could talk about. But is it really just about power? Is it about the strong doing what they can in the weak, uh, simply enduring what they must? Or is there more to it than this? And if so, uh, what do we as historians need to do or should we be doing uh, to inform not just us, but uh, the general public about these issues and how they continue to resonate into the 21st century? So with that, let me uh, wrap up and uh, turn it over to you guys uh, for questions, comments, suggestions, complaints, uh, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to access my... Uh, uh, my chat function here, or my e or text, and see if I have anything. So, so I'm not seeing anything at this point. Uh, but uh, Sarah uh, or Mark, uh, is there anything else that you guys need to add? Okay. Yep, I've got uh, Sarah's comments here. Uh, not seeing any questions or comments, uh, but uh, if it's okay with Sarah and with Mark, uh, if you think of something, uh, and if it's possible, uh, you can email that uh, to the Dole Center. And um, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. 
or if you have any suggestions um, for personal reasons and professional reasons, I'd be more than happy to accept those uh, as well. And just to give a few more moments here, I know we're almost to the normal stopping time, but uh, just to put in a plug for my dear colleague, John Q, uh, he will be presenting Victory at Sea. Uh, I don't remember the subtitle, but if you've ever heard John speak or ever spoken with him, uh, I'm a phenomenal individual, uh, one of the greatest intellects I have met, uh, retired Navy commander. Uh, he's taught everywhere <laughs> and just about everything. Uh, so I, uh, I look forward. To, I wish I could attend his presentation next week uh, in person. But uh, for those that can attend, I highly recommend it. And again, let me offer my thanks and appreciation for you listening to me today. I know the virtual environment is not always the most ideal. Uh, I do miss the, the nonverbals and the interaction that face-to-face -face brings. Uh, but again, I, I am truly grateful for all those that were able to attend. And hopefully you find this uh, somewhat useful. Uh, if not, please let me know and I can uh, take my research in another direction. That being said, uh, Sarah or Mark, anything else we need to do at this time? Over. Okay, that being said, the, the last image I had, just in case I had any questions, was just an image of Pope Francis, um, uh, I think it's with the Cree Nation up in, uh, uh, in Alberta, uh, as part of his visit here, which I think is a, a, mag a magnificent step, uh, as far as uh, probably long overdue uh, reconciliation uh, initiatives uh, by the Pope, given, particularly given his current health condition. So uh, I'll just throw that up to try to reemphasize uh, the currency uh, of this notion of settler colonialism, whether you buy into it or not, uh, and kind of leave it at that. But again, uh, thanks uh, for uh, your attendance again. Thanks to uh, Mark and Sarah and the Dole Center. And hopefully uh, one of these days I'll physically make it and COVID will not be an impediment uh, in the future.